I'm going to start tonight by, uh, by reading to you a, sh a short section from Teach Like a Champion 2.0, which is the revised version of my book. Um, and I don't usually read. In fact, I've never read at a presentation. I'm a little bit embarrassed to for two reasons. First, because um, it always struck me as a little bit pretentious to read to a group of people. I mean, like, this ain't Shakespeare. Let's be honest. <laughs> but also, when I was a teacher, uh, the administrator would often, uh, my administrator would send an email out with you know, six bullet points to all the teachers. And then he would call us to a meeting in which he would say, I sent you an email and it said, ba 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 and he'd go through all the six points that he'd, said in his, he'd put in his email. And I always found myself thinking, why do I have to be here in a meeting if you sent me an email? In fact, uh, like most teachers, I was smart enough to figure out, this means I don't really have to read your emails. Um, and I really want to encourage you to read the book. So, uh, so with great caution, I'm going to read uh, a little bit of it to you for a reason that I hope will become clear, and which this very strange first slide intimates. Uh, so this is the introduction, the art of teaching and its tools. Great teaching is an art. In the other arts, painting, sculpture, the writing of novels, great masters leverage a proficiency with basic tools to transform the rawest materials, stone, paper, ink, into the most valued assets in society. This alchemy is all the more astounding because the tools often appear unremarkable to others. Who would look at a chisel, a mallet, and a file and imagine them producing Michelangelo's David? Great art relies on the mastery and application of foundational skills learned through diligent study, craftsmanship, if you will. You learn to strike a chisel with a mallet and refine the skill with time, learning at what angle to strike the chisel and how tightly to hold it. Someday, perhaps years later, observers may assess the philosophy expressed by what you create. But far more important than any theory is your proficiency with the lowly chisel. True, not everyone who, who learns to drive a chisel will create a David, but neither can anyone who fails to master the, the tool do much more than make marks on rocks. Every artist, teachers included, is an artisan whose task is to study a set of tools and to unlock the secrets of their use. A chisel appears mundane, but the more you understand it, the more it guides you to see what's possible. Rounding a contour with unexpected smoothness, the chisel causes you to realize suddenly that you could bring added subtlety to a facial expression, more tension to the muscles of the figure you're sculpting, and this changes your vision for it. Mastery of tools does not just allow creation, it informs it. The process is often far from glamorous. An artist's life is a tradesman's life, really characterized by calluses and stone dust requiring diligence and humility, but its rewards are immense. It's a worthy life's work. Traveling abroad during my junior year in college, <clears throat> I saw Picasso's school notebooks on display at the Picasso Museum in Barcelona. Now you know why I'm reading this. Uh, what I remember best are the sketches filling the margins of his pages. These weren't sketchbooks, mind you. These were notebooks, like those every student keeps of notes from lectures. The tiny sketches memorialized a teacher's face or Picasso's own hand grasping a pencil with perfect perspective, line, and shading. I had always thought Picasso's work was about abstraction, about a way of thinking that rendered the ability to draw accurately and realistically irrelevant. His sketches told another story bearing witness to his mastery of fundamentals and constant drive to refine his skills. Even in, the stray moments of, even in the stray moments of his schooling, he was honing the building blocks of his technique. He was an artisan first, and then an artist, as the fact that he filled by one account 178 sketchbooks in his life further attests. So as you can see, uh, I'm especially glad to be speaking in Barcelona tonight because it all started here uh, 27 years ago. Uh, as a, uh, as a university uh, student wandering the streets of Barcelona. It was very interesting that I went back to the Picasso Museum this morning to see if I could find those sketches that I remembered uh, and see if they really looked like I remembered them, and I couldn't find them. Uh, I don't know whether they changed the exhibit or I remember them uh, in a distorted way. There were many, many sketches, and I think the principal still holds that he was sketching constantly. But I went back to try and find them today. So uh, thank you to Barcelona for starting this journey for me. I want to start uh, tonight by telling you a story. Uh, and this is a story about uh, a hero. It takes place in, uh, in Los Angeles, so we know that uh, Los Angeles is the place that manufactures stories about hero, uh, heroes. Uh, but this is the hero of our story, and her name is Zenaida Tan. And um, 
no one in the room has ever heard of Zenaida Tan. And when I talk about her in the United States, no one has ever heard of her either. Um, and I just want to, uh, and, and the int reason that she's interesting is because uh, she was the feature in a story in the Los Angeles Times about four or five years ago. And she was featured because the Los Angeles Times found out that Los Angeles Unified School District, the uh, government entity that runs all the schools in the city of Los Angeles, 10 million people, something like that, had had data for 10 years or so about which teachers got, and got what results with their students. And some teachers, it turned out, um, got two to three times the amount of growth every year in math and reading as the average student in the district. And no one had ever done anything with this, with this data, and no one even knew who they were. But the Times got their hands on this data, and they went out to observe and interview these teachers. And one of these teachers was, one of these teachers was Zenaida Tan, who for 10 or 20 years had been, had been achieving student achievement two to three times the average teacher in the district. So uh, here is the Los Angeles Times story. Here's what they wrote about her. And I just want to tell you before I read a little segment of it to you that it, it's a scary story. So uh, prepare yourself. Do you want to dim the lights or something? Just kidding. LA Unified School District has hundreds of teachers who, this is, I'm reading from the article in the New York Times. LA Unified School District has hundreds of teachers who preside over remarkable successes year after year, often against incredible odds. But most are like Zenaida Tan, working in obscurity. No one asks them their secrets. Most of the time, no one even says, good job. Often, even their own colleagues and principals don't know who they are. Tan brims with effective ways to reach limited English students, handle discipline problems, and keep the kids engaged. I do a lot of singing, games, she said. It doesn't look like a lesson. But no one asks her for her advice. She says her fellow teachers at Morningside Elementary School consider her strict, even mean. She tends to keep to herself. Nobody tells me that I'm a strong teacher, she says. That's OK by her. She adds, year after year, she watches her students make enormous progress and feels a quiet sense of satisfaction. By LAUSD's measure, Tan meets standard performance, that's her evaluation, as virtually all district teachers do. 3% uh, of teachers in LA Unified District did not get this score in the year in question. Evaluators' only other option is below standard performance. On a recent evaluation, her principal checked off all the appropriate boxes, Tan said, then uh, noted that she had been late to pick up her students from recess three times. I threw it away because I got upset, Tan said. Why don't you focus on my teaching? Why don't you focus on where my students are? So you might be thinking, why is that such a scary story? But I actually think this is terrifying. Uh, to think that we have incredible assets in our classrooms, incredible skill in our classrooms, people who can coax two to three times the amount of learning out of a student as the average teacher, and yet, the systems that we use to evaluate them, develop them professionally, all but drive them out of the system, number one. They fail to make her better. Uh, they fail to even make her feel valued. The most amazing thing about th this is that she stayed after getting an evaluation like this. It's a happy accident that she's still doing the, the work that she does. But in fact, it's even scarier than that, because what this represents to me is a system failure. Because um, no one has learned anything from Zenaida Tan's incredible success. And that means that uh, all, the teachers in the all the teachers in the building who pot could potentially get better are not getting better. And the cost of this is a huge failure rate among teachers in the inner city uh, in the inner city in the United States. In fact, the data says that 50% of the teachers who enter teaching in the toughest schools in the United, in the United States in our inner cities, where they teach high poverty kids, leave the profession within three years. 50%. They know when they start the job they're not going to be paid that well. They know it's going to be difficult. They know it's going to be challenging, and yet half of them give up and leave. Because they face difficult challenges and difficult problems in the classroom, and the solution to some of those problems is right down the hallway in Zenaida Tan's classroom, and no one ever walks down the hallway to walk into her classroom and say, wow, what could we learn from her? How could we share this among our teachers and ensure that more teachers are more successful?
This idea of studying bright spots, which is the notion that success is more important than failure if you want to build organizational change. Uh, we stole from a book called Switch by Chip and Dan Heath. And if you like to read, uh, I don't think it's been translated, but if you like to read in English, it's an incredibly tremendous book. It describes the history of, of organizational change and social change uh, in different sectors of the economy. And one of the, so they make a bunch of really brilliant observations in this book. And one of them is that we assume that the size of a problem and the size of the solution have to be the same. If you have a big problem, you have to have a big, complex solution to fix it. But oftentimes, there are lots of examples of very simple solutions, making a lot of headway and solving complex problems. And so what they say, the way to learn those things, the way to learn what solutions have high leverage is to study success. We spend our time wringing our hands about the, prob wringing our hands about the problems, but it's the solutions that are more powerful. And so, you know, even here in Barcelona, there are hundreds of Zenaida Tans out there in your school system. Where are they? Who are they? Do you know? Have we studied them? Have we tried to learn from them? They're the incredible power of bright spots, right? If we found out what made them so successful, we could share that information, uh, and that would be, you could argue, the fastest way to get better. This makes me think about achievement gaps. We talk about, in the United States, about, about the achievement gap. Do you have that expression here? For us, it's the gap between students of poverty and students of privilege. It's a massive gap in the United States. Uh, and it means that we have a generation of students who are consigned to perpetual poverty because they aren't able to participate in the economy. But really, that's only one of the achievement gaps that we face. There are many achievement gaps. There's the achievement gap between rich and poor, but there's the achievement gap between uh, American schools and the best school systems in the world. And even if we close that gap, there would be the gap between our kids and what they deserve and the schools that we give them, right? There's no, there's no, uh, there's no, there's no good that would be good enough when, there are, when it's our children in education. And so there's always a gap that we're trying to close. And the interesting thing about gaps is that there is no achievement gap that some teacher somewhere has not closed. There is some teacher in, who, uh, in whose classroom the highest poverty kids uh, with the most difficult homes still achieve great things. There is some teacher uh, in your country or in our country whose, achie whose achievement results uh, dramatically outstrip name the country that has you know, incredible uh, PISA scores. There is some teacher out there who is as close as you can be, at least, to the education that our kids all deserve. We just don't know who she is, and we need to find her and study her and share out what she does. And this implies to me the, um, one of the most fascinating things about teaching, which is teachers get told all the time. Experts tell them, this is what your classroom needs to be. But actually, the solutions to many of teaching's challenges and education's challenges actually come from the teachers, or could come from the teachers themselves. They're a vast, untapped pool of resources and knowledge about the most important work in our society. Uh, but basically, we don't know the placebo from the cure. Imagine if we did medicine this way, uh, if we didn't really have any sense for, uh, uh, if we didn't do elaborate medical testing on our medicines and we just gave them to people and hoped that they worked and chose the pill that was the prettiest when someone we knew was sick. Uh, it wouldn't work very well. So does this matter? Yes, this matters. Uh, this is data by the American economist uh, Eric Hanischek. And in it, he tracks the GDP growth rates of Western Hemisphere nations for 40 years from 1960 to 2000 and correlates it to educational outcomes on the PISA and a similar test. So interestingly, um, when you correlate uh, ed, uh, economic growth, GDP growth annually to the amount of time that kids spend in school in each nation, that's on the right, you get almost no correlation. How much time kids spend in school has almost no effect on economic growth. But when you correlate um, adjusted test scores, educational outcomes, the results of teaching in the classroom, you explain 80% of GDP growth over 40 years. In other words, in addition to uh, being responsible for the hopes and dreams and aspirations of individual children uh, uh, every year, they're also te our teachers are also responsible for driving the economy. So um, if there are teachers in the room, thank you <laughs> for that and everything else you do. So this matters deeply. So we set out to study teachers. That's kind of the idea behind Teach Like a Champion. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what that, what that looked like and what we found. So first, this is a picture of New York State. Everybody recognize it? 
ever seen New York? Are you expecting to see the towers of Manhattan maybe when we, I tell you this is New York State? But this is to me a much more important picture of New York State. Uh, this is every school system in New York State graphed according to two data points. On the x-axis on the bottom is the percentage of kids in, every, in each school system, or each school in this case, uh, that lives in poverty. So on the right, every single uh, kid in the school is uh, eligible for, for public assistance, and on the left, no kids are. The y-axis tells you how they did in student achievement, in this case, on the 2011 sixth grade math results, so 11 and 12 year olds. So 100% of the kids in the school got it right at the top, nobody in the school got uh, passed the test at the bottom. And so this is kind of where I started with this. I was recovering at the time from an MBA. Um, thank you, I feel much better. But, uh, uh, and I was used to using data sets to think about problems. And so uh, I ran this data set, which shows that there's a really strong correlation between poverty and educational outcomes. Zip, co zip code is destiny. I don't know if this is the same in, uh, in, uh, in Catalonia. But in the United States, you can almost graph the degree to which if you have the lack of foresight to be born in a postal code uh, that's characterized by poverty, your educational outcomes are not very promising. In fact, we can quantify the degree to which every uh, additional percentage of impoverished students in your school drives down the likely, the likely outcomes. And so I looked at this data the first time and I spent a lot of time wringing my hands thinking about the problem. This is not just, this is not fair. Democracy and, uh, <laughs> and uh, prosperity are not sustainable with a model like this. But it's an interesting question to think, I went to go back to Chip and Dan Heath's observation that solutions are more important than problems. Because there's a strong correlation does not mean, does not mean it's a cause. Correlation and cause are different. And in fact, there are teachers every day like Zenaida Tan who achieve incredible results with high poverty kids, despite all the difficulties of those kids, and we have no idea who they are. So I cut data like this, and I went out to find as many of those classrooms and those schools as I possibly could, and I snuck into them when they would let me come visit them. And as soon as I went there, I thought, my god, this is incredible. I have to document this. And so I brought a video camera with me. And the very first videos that I shot, uh, they look like terrible 1980s era wedding footage, you know, like the, <laughs> the, the cameras like this. But what you see in those, uh, in those and that footage is incredible. And in fact, I still remember the moment when I saw a teacher do something that I had never seen a teacher do before uh, in a classroom. And two weeks later, I was taping in a school 300 miles away, and I saw a teacher do the same thing. And I thought, you know, there are things that they do that are different. Uh, and so uh, I set out to, to try and describe what those things, what those things are. What, what do the highest performing teachers do that makes them different from the merely good? And those are the things that I tried to describe in Teach Like a Champion. One of the things that strike me that what are the things that they have solutions to? It's a combination of what I would say the sublime, are the sublime and the mundane. Um, there is incredible genius in the classroom of great teachers, and there are very simple things that they do very well that are often beneath the threshold of narration. We don't even think that they're talking about them. And this reminds me that um, there are two types of problems, challenges that you face in a classroom as a teacher. There are exotic problems and endemic problems. I have a picture of a pigeon up here because this is an example of an exotic problem. A friend of mine who teaches in Houston started the school year this year and there was a nest of pigeons in the corner of his classroom. And every time he tried to discuss the novel that they were talking about, the pigeons would flap and squawk and one of them would try and fly out the window and the window wasn't open and so the pigeon would slam against the window and the kids would all turn around and he got very little done for quite a while. That is what I would call an exotic problem. You should not enter the classroom having left your teacher training prepared to deal with that specific problem. You're not, a, you know, that, that's, it's non-repeating. But the classroom is full of the opposite, endemic problems, entirely predictable problems. You know when you enter the classroom, you're going to have some kids who, uh, who want to check out and sit in the corner and not be bothered and they want to just be left alone. And we know that we can't leave them alone for a month, for a week or a month or a year because the price is too high. And so we have to, we have, to have a solution to that. And we know that at some point in your, in your classroom, you're going to ask a kid to do something and that kid is going to talk back. Uh, I talked to a teacher the other day who said her first day of teaching, she walked into the classroom and she said, okay, boys and girls, sit down, please. And a boy looked at her and said, you sit down. <laughs> so we should, I don't know if that, we have real um, 
cultural and behavioral issues in many schools in the US. I don't know if it's the same here, but uh, you have to be ready for that, right? If you get nervous and you think, oh my god, I never thought this would happen, you don't have a chance. And so one of the things about great teachers is that they have developed and problem solved solutions to these predictable challenges and problems of the classroom. But we have them spread them out. So thousands and thousands and thousands of teachers walk into the classroom every year totally unprepared for problems that are predictable. And if they're going to give their, lives, their lives and their hearts and their souls to the most important work in society, we really ought to be able to help them address those problems so that they can be thinking about math and literature and science and art and history and not how am I going to get this kid to talk respectfully to me? Or how am I going to motivate this kid to learn? Or how can I, how can I phrase the question so that it's as rigorous as possible for every kid in my classroom? So here are some things you're probably wondering. What, so what, tell me more about some of the things that you think you saw in high-performing teachers' classrooms. And so I thought I'd give you a couple of examples of things that stood out. Um, and I tried to choose a couple of just very different things because it was a really big, wide portfolio of types of things. I talked about the sublime and the mundane. Maybe I'll talk about the mundane first. And one observation is that efficiency matters. You only get so many minutes with your kids, and if you squander them, you can't get them back. And so uh, great teachers have a light obsession, often, with efficiency. I should just note that when I talk about great teachers, like all teachers are different. Some teachers, uh, some teachers are great using none of these tools, and God bless them for it. Right? But in general, the theme that I see is uh, a moderate to light obsession with efficiency. Here's the inside of one of those teachers' classrooms. This is a guy named Doug McCurry. He teaches in New Haven, Connecticut. His kids are 96% eligible for, pub uh, for uh, public assistance, and they outperform one of the, the richest school districts in uh, Connecticut, which is about 20 miles away, uh, and almost all the kids go to college. This is the very first day of school uh, in Doug's classroom. I'm going to... Um, but one thing I, I know there's translation that many of you also speak English. It's hard to hear on the video because he's talking fast and the sound is muddy, so I'm just going to kind of semi-translate as he goes. So, uh, so here's Doug, the first day of school with, with his kids. What I do want to work on is how to pass out papers. So he says, the first thing I'm going to do, the first thing I want to work on is how to pass out papers. Now, instantly when I show this uh, to uh, assemble groups of teachers in the U.S., someone raises their hand and says, how dare he? How dare he train kids to be robots uh, and uh, practice passing out papers? He should be teaching them the causes of the Civil War. Okay, I am going to pass papers on the row, and they're going to come over. The only person who needs to get out of their seat is my friend James. So he says, I'm going to pass papers down the rows. Uh, they're going to come across. The only person who has to get out of their seat is James. Because James is a big space between James and Bruce. Because James has to get up and cross the gap between him and Bruce. So let me show you what I will do. I will hand out, there's four people here. So I'm going to put four pieces of paper here. Denzel will take one, and he'll put, hand the other stack to James. James will put one down, and James will quietly go to Bruce. Bruce will take one, and he'll quietly give it to his friend, Mr. Sanford. It's an excellent job. It's exactly what happened. So he's having them walk through. James will give it to Bruce. Bruce will give it to uh, the next boy, and they'll pass it down the rows. Good job. Let's, he's, uh, let's try that again, he says. 12 seconds. Back in in 10. He says, you did it in 12 seconds. See if you can, uh, we pass them out in 12 seconds. Back in in 10. Eleven seconds. Back out in ten. Eleven seconds. Back out in ten. A lot of people say if you do this kind of thing with kids, like they'll rebel, right? They hate this kind of structure. If you did this on the first day of teaching, they would hate you forever. Just look at this kid in the middle here. Do you have the expression on the edge of your seat? In, uh, in, uh, in Catalan or Spanish, right? We, in America, on the edge of your seat means you're very, very excited. He is literally on the edge of his seat. He's, uh, he, he can't stand the excitement any longer. He's having a great time. Back in an eight. Now he says, now he says uh, they pass it out in ten, back in an eight. It's pretty good. All right, pretty so good, one thing says. we're also going to do in this class we have... So, um, he's taken this notion of passing out papers. By the way, sometimes when I introduce this video, I ask teachers, how long does it take you to pass out or collect a set of papers in your classroom? And the average is usually a minute or two. 
right? That's the average. But one teacher once said zero. And I said, really, zero? How? And she said, well, most teachers stop handing out papers because it's so difficult and it becomes so distracting and disruptive that they stop give, I've stopped giving my, teachers, my kids materials. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, uh, so let's assume that Doug spends... 20 minutes practicing this with his kids, and maybe he spends 20 minutes practicing it again, right? This crazy mundane notion of passing out papers. But they can do it a minute faster than they can in another classroom. Let's just run the numbers on that for a second. Let's say he can save a minute every time he passes out or collects materials, and over the course of a student's life in a school day, they, pass out, they have materials passed out and collected 10 times, which is probably a conservative estimate. Hopefully they're getting a lot more materials than that. In the U.S., uh, so that's 10 minutes per day saved. In the U.S., we have 190 school days in a typical school, so that's 1,900 minutes of school per year. Uh, in 60 minutes per hour, that's 32 hours per year of additional instructional time that Doug has just manufactured in this clip. In other words, that's at a seven-hour school day, that's four and a half days of additional instructional time. And so the answer to the question is, how dare he do this? Why isn't he teaching the causes of the Civil War? The answer is, because now he will have a week to teach the causes of the Civil War. He's performed a minor miracle. But find me the school of education that would stoop in the United States to teach its teachers how to teach their kids to pass out papers. So sometimes the things that make teachers highly effective in the classroom are incredibly mundane, but great teachers are very, very intentional to the craftsmanship of these little things in their classroom. That does not mean that that's all great teaching is. It's obviously asking great questions and, uh, and pushing kids to be rigorous and making kids do uh, most of the cognitive work. But this foundation of systems is critical. The second, uh, the second thing I'd like to point out is a, is a larger thing that characterizes great teachers. This phrase, I taught it, is not they learned it, comes from uh, one of the greatest basketball coaches of all things in the United States, John Wooden. He's the most successful basketball coach in the history of uh, American universities. He's a legend. He got voted the greatest coach in any sport in the 20th century by ESPN. And the interesting thing about John Wooden is that he started out as an English teacher. He was a literature teacher. And even when he had, you know, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar played for him, he read his team's poetry during practice sessions. I have no idea how they responded to it, but apparently he did it. And he says that the reason he was a great coach is because he thought about coaching as, as teaching and that he thought about his practice set, he thought about the practice sessions more than the games and he thought about his practice sessions as being like English lessons. And he said, the mark of a great coach is knowing the difference between I taught it and they learned it. In other words, you can stand up in front of your classroom for an hour and explain to the kids how to add fractions with unlike denominators, but that is very different from whether they learned it. And so great teachers engineer ways to constantly understand what is happening in the minds of their students. Are they getting, are they picking up when I'm putting down? Are they understanding this? Are they learning it? Because there is not a teacher in the world who has not stood up at the front of a classroom for an hour and given the test later and been like, oh my God, <laughs> they got nothing. Of course that happens. It's the most natural thing to have happen in work as difficult as teaching. So here's, um, I'm going to show you two qu videos very quickly of teachers doing very subtle things that allow them to check for understanding. This video is going to be really, really fast. So um, watch carefully. This is Shadell Purifoy. She teaches at a school in Newark, New Jersey, uh, which is one of the uh, toughest school districts in the country. One, uh, one to two percent of kids in this school district uh, graduate and go on to university. And at her school, which is now K-12, 100% of the kids who graduated went on to university. So here she is with her kindergartners. Watch, in particular, her interaction with this little girl. This girl is named Kayla. Okay, scholars. So today we're going to read a book called Clever Fox. So she says, okay, students, okay, scholars, today we're going to read a book called Clever Fox. The title of our book is Clever Fox. The title of the book is Clever Fox. The title of our book is Clever Fox. Does anyone know what clever means? What does clever mean? What does clever mean? Kayla, do you know what clever means? No. No. Uh, so she asked Kayla if she knew what clever means, and Kayla says no. Okay, Isaiah. Clever means smart. Clever means that you're really smart. Kayla, what does clever mean? Clever means smart. Clever means that you're smart. So looking at the front cover, looking at the front cover, what do you notice? What do you notice? It's real. There's something, it, uh, kindergartners are so cute, aren't they? <laughs> it's my biggest takeaway from this video. But my second big, biggest takeaway is about something that um, Shadell does that's really subtle here. Uh, 
I want to play it again. Watch, just watch Kayla and watch her hand. Is, is it normal in, uh, in uh, Catalonia that kids raise their hand when they want to participate, right? That's pretty normal. Okay, so watch her. Okay, scholars. So, today we're going to read a book called Clever Fox. The title of our book is Clever Fox. The title of our book is Clever Fox. Does anyone know what clever means? What does clever mean? What does clever mean? Oh, darn. Clever means that you're really smart. Kayla, what does clever mean? Do you know what clever means? No. Clever means. What does clever mean? Kayla is the only student in the room who does not have her hand up. And Shadell calls on her. So much time as teachers, we think about calling on kids as managing participation. Who gets to play? But it actually has a much more important function, which is it, it's a source of data. This is one of the ways that Shadell understands what her students know. And so she's clearly thinking about calling on kids as a form of data. How do I know what my students know? And who's the most important kid in the classroom? Who's the kid who's, mo who's most likely not to understand the answer to this question? It's the one kid in the room with her hand not up. It's Kayla. And so what she's using here is one of the techniques in the book, which is called cold calling, which is building a culture of calling on the kids regardless of whether they have their hands in the air. Because if all you ever do is call on the, the kids with their hands in the air, you will get a skewed data set. You will always think you are more successful than you are because the kids who raise their hand may not know it for sure, but they're certainly more likely to know it than Kayla. It's also fascinating because Kayla starts to put her hand up like, oh, no, no, I can't do it. So it's this moment of like fear and risk for Kayla. And so actually it's a beautiful moment when Shadell says, actually, I'd like to hear what you think there. And Kayla doesn't get it right. But um, Shadell, by the way, doesn't do anything like, um, Kayla, we've been working on this all day. We talked about the meaning of clever yesterday, which sometimes we do, which has the uh, unintended consequence of communicating to Kayla, you are an idiot, right? And then she will never raise her hand again. Shadell doesn't say anything when Kayla gets it wrong. She says, okay. She goes to uh, Isaiah. Isaiah provides the answer. She comes back to Kayla. Kayla gets it right. And she says, clever means smart. I don't know if you can tell this in the translation, but Kayla's really happy about getting it right. And so the other thing, in addition to using this notion of cold call to check for understanding, to be able to, I determine the teacher who I call on sometimes because I want to gather data, she's also built this thing called a culture of error, which makes it safe to be wrong. It doesn't mean I don't tell kids when they're wrong. It means that uh, I have to, I manage my own affect when kids get it wrong, because the only way you can be right in the long run is to be wrong in the short run. So if kids are afraid to be wrong and they feel chastened when they're wrong, they won't take the risk of trying and they will try and hide their errors from you. And if they hide their errors from you, it's 10 times more difficult to discover them than if they willingly share their mistakes. And so uh, there are two key elements of this notion of checking for understanding, determining I taught it from they learned it in this one, her decision to cold call, and two, the culture that she's built in her classroom. Really quickly, if I have time, can uh, I think I have time. Do I have time to show one more? I'm going to show one more video because I can't stop showing video of teachers once I start. Um, this is Katie Bellucci. Uh, I think this, this, uh, these are older kids, and it demonstrates some of the same principles of check for understanding here, both the cultural aspects and the technical aspects. She is teaching. Uh, it's not grade 7. It's actually fifth grade math, so this is 11 years. All right, here we go. Pencils down in three. So they've solved a problem on their own at their desks. And she says, pencils down in three, two, one, and she's going to call on them to find out what their answers were. Watch how she does it. Most of us have an answer. Two, one. Rocks, paper, scissors, your answer on two, one, two. Hold them up high. Do you have the game rock, rock paper, scissors in, in Spain? So this is like uh, rock. It's a, it's a kid's game. Rock beats scissors beats paper. Uh, so this is her version of it, uh, it, and they are holding up their finger to correspond to their, the answer choice. It's a multiple choice question. So now she can scan the room and see what everyone's answer is and understand the data, right? In fact, she's going to tell you in a second what the data is, uh, what answers kids gave. We have some different answers out here. I see twos, threes, and fours, B, C, and D. I don't know if you can hear it in her tone of voice, but she says, B, C, N, D. She's really, she's excited about the fact that there's disagreement. Talk about building a culture of error, right? Uh, not, some of us didn't get this right. Some of us have not been paying attention, but oh boy, we all didn't get the same answer. Let's study it and find out why. And by the way, she says, twos, threes, and fours. What was the right answer? We don't even know at this point, and neither do the kids. 
So now she's going to do what great teachers do, right? Now she's recognized that she taught it, but they didn't all learn it. So she's going to go back and re-explain it and reteach it. <clears throat> First of all, let's go back to this original equation. One half times the quantity x plus 2 equals 20. Based on the answer choices, are we going to distribute or are we going to divide by one half? I like these hands. One of the other techniques in the book is wait time, which is how much time you leave after your question before you take the answer. She gave about four seconds of wait time there. That's eight times as long as the average teacher lasts. The average teacher waits half a second before taking an answer. And you can see, see, one kid had their hand up right away, right? One kid knew automatically, that's the kid we usually call on. And what that means is that everyone else in the room stops thinking about it. But by not calling, not calling them there now, everyone in the room is thinking about the question. And the kids learn, by the way, if you always call on the fast kid, they're like, I'm not even going to try anymore. I'm never going to beat Jose. So like, here I am. I'm off the hook for math. Sherwin. Who agrees with Sherwin? Yeah, we are going to divide by one half. I saw a lot of you do that. So if you divide by one half on both sides, what happens to these halves over here? Can you see the problem? It's one half times x plus two equals twenty, and now she's walking them through uh, dividing. Uh, sorry, uh, dividing by one half or multiplying by two, as it turns out, to get rid of the x over two. I'm sorry, the one half at the at the front end of the first expression. Roseby, they cancel each other out. I gotta get a darker pen. Here we go. They cancel each other out, and we're left with what on this side of the equation? Naquan. Me too. We're left with 10. So you chose answer choice B? Yeah. Who else chose, chose B? Okay, 20 divided by 1 half. Let's write that out on the side. 20 divided by 1 half. The kids who chose answer choice B divided 20 by 2, not by 1 half. Right, so that's why they got it wrong. They got 10. The answer, of course, the answer is 40. What's the answer? How many times does one half go into 20? Naquan's smiling over there. Naquan, is it 10 times? Naquan, who she's calling on here, is the kid who got it wrong the first time. Oh, it's not. Interesting. How many times does it go into 20? Flip that fraction. Do your multiplication. You know how to do that part. Uh, what do you Listen to how happy she is describing their error here. What do you say, Avisha? Who agrees with Avisha? Who changed their mind? About their answer. Yeah, hold them up high. Be proud. Hold them up high. Be proud. You changed your mind. You figured it out, right? Figuring it out is more important, more positive in her class than knowing it in the first place. Yes, it's important that we have to know it in the long run. But here we see a teacher, one, gathering data instantly on her students, two, responding to the data to reteach instantly in, in response to that, and then three, making it safe and positive to make short-term mistakes on the, on the path to long-term success. You just figured it out. Yeah, what is the answer? Everyone on two, B, C, or D. Just say the letter. Ready? One, two. C. That is correct. So uh, those are some examples of some of the things that we found inside of uh, great teachers' classrooms. And those are, uh, those are videos that you will find in Teach Like a Champion 2.0 if you, if you choose to read it, which I hope you will. You certainly won't agree with everything that I think that I found in great teachers' classrooms, but uh, hopefully you will, uh, you will find inspiration and, if nothing else, a fascination in the careful study of the work that teachers do all day, every day. A couple more uh, clips here, which I won't show unless uh, you're dying to see them during the question uh, period, because I just want to make a couple of more quick points about what happens when you study teachers. This is my day job. This is my job now, by the way. I spend all my time watching video or watching lessons by teachers. It is so, it never stops being fascinating and intellectually stimulating. One thing you do is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the phrase cultural capital, but cultural capital is any non-financial social asset that promotes an individual's status beyond their economic means. When you have cultural capital, no matter what anyone pays you, you are important. It's one of the reasons why people go to university, right? Yes, they know they'll get better paid jobs, but there's also status to have, uh, to have studied at university. And so one of the things that I think happens when we study teachers and honor them, uh, and when we ask them to participate in building the knowledge base of the profession, is that we increase their cultural capital and make the profession's status higher. Instead of saying, you dumb teachers, let us tell you what to do in the classroom, we say, ah, actually, why don't you help us, why don't we collect the knowledge of the most capable among us, 
and let that determine how we do our work and let's, let's build it internally. You, you're not only uh, executing, but you're building the knowledge of the field. You are an intellectual when you are a teacher. Uh, that to me is, an, you know, we, one of the things we know about the most effective school systems in the world is that teaching is a high status profession and this is just a really easy, low cost fix. Yes, we should pay teachers as much as we can, but let's also make teachers understand that we respect them for their intellect. One of the other things that happens, by the way, is you develop shared vocabulary. Even if you disagree with everything that I wrote in the book, if you read the book, you would have about 150 terms to talk about the thousands of decisions that teachers make in their classroom every day. And then you and your teachers, or you and your fellow teachers, could go off and talk about it and say, yeah, that was a moment when actually uh, I don't think we checked for understanding as effectively as we could, and we probably needed to gather data there. And I feel like the culture of error in the classroom could be a little bit stronger. And then you can have peer-to-peer -peer conversations and constantly develop new insight that's specific to your kids in your school. And that's really what happened with um, Teach Like a Champion 1 became obsolete to me very, very quickly after I wrote it, because teachers talked about the things, and they came up with much better applications than what I described in the book. And so a year or two after writing it, I'd go to teachers' classrooms, and they'd be doing kind of like the things that I described in the book, but so much better. And I, was, I just thought to myself, holy cow, I have to, you know, I have to start writing that down. So shared vocabulary uh, empowers knowledge sharing. Finally, it starts with data. Uh, historically, breakthroughs in innovation have been preceded by breakthroughs in measurement. We understand how the structure of a cell works because we're able to weigh and measure the elements of the nucleus. And therefore, we can make insights that lead to you know, all the things that nuclear physicists do that change our lives, but I don't really understand them. But <laughs> uh, measurement precedes innovation. And so when we can start to, uh, measurement will always be imperfect, but, uh, and we want to use it carefully. But when we start to be comfortable with the no notion of trying to measure what we do in the classroom, we can begin to have insights. And I think that we're on the brink of kind of a golden age of knowledge generated from teachers by setting out to and getting better and better over time at measuring their work. When you start to measure, people will resist data at first. They will say, I don't want to be measured. This is an imperfect measurement. Do not measure me. If you use the data well, that resistance won't last. I did this with a, a school, my, the, kids, the school that my kids go to. The principal came to me and said, could we build some assessments together that we use to figure out what we're doing in the classrooms? And the so the principal said this, and we built some assessments together, and the teachers were like, I'm not taking any test. Um, but they did it anyway. And after three months, the teacher said, when are we giving the next test? Because the principal was really smart, and she didn't evaluate anyone based on the test. She used it to get them smarter. And they looked at the questions together, and they said, why did the kids get these questions wrong? And then they felt like, wow, this test gives me insight. It makes me smarter at my job. I like this. I want to do this. Uh, and so she, she earned their buy-in. Data is a, uh, a management tool. In other words, uh, it doesn't, it's not an algorithm. Just how one teacher does on one test doesn't tell you whether they're a good teacher. But data in the aggregate can give you insights. And finally, accountability and autonomy have to live together. If we're going to measure what people do in the classroom, they have to have the flexibility to do what they want to to try and achieve those results. If you get accountability but no autonomy, uh, someone measures you but you don't, get, you don't get to decide what you do all day, A, it's not as fun a job. We want teachers to love teaching. Uh, and B, it feels miserable, right? So we have to make sure that we um, give teachers real freedom and real flexibility if we're going to measure. But when you measure, one of the things will happen is we'll start, people get put in buckets. This is an expression we use in the US for grouping teachers by of the long run, of their effect, by saying there is a night of tans in the world. It's the hardest job in the economy. So some people are going to be better at it than others. Hopefully, we'll develop everyone to be better over time. But there are some Zenaida tans out there. And when you start worrying about measurement, people say, what's going to happen to the low-performing teachers? How will we deal with them? Will we kick them out of the profession? Will they be shamed? And those are important questions. No, we shouldn't shame anyone is the short answer. But more important than the bucket of low-performing teachers is the bucket of high-performing teachers. They are the most important people in the profession, and they are generally and genuinely ignored by the profession. Your reward in an American school for being really good is to be ignored by the organization. The principal walks by a room, looks in, yep, looks pretty good, and the reward is, I can go deal with somebody else. I can go try and coach some teacher who's struggling like crazy and who's probably going to leave in a year or two anyway. When the most important, uh, the most effective person in the building goes undeveloped uh, and unacknowledged by the organization.
it should not be the reward of excellence to be ignored by the organization that you work for. So uh, those are some thoughts about Teach Like a Champion, where it came from, and uh, what it means to study teachers. Uh, I hope you'll also read the book, but I'm also happy to, these are some of our students at uh, one of our uncommon schools in New York City. God, they're beautiful. Uh, so you, uh, you perhaps have questions or comments, and now I'm gonna put on my headset and I'm happy to take them. I think that one of the things about teaching that is least acknowledged is how lonely a job it can be. In what other job do you walk in front of 30, 10-year-olds, close the door, uh, and, uh, and spend the day in an incredible number of highly emotional, highly fraught, highly intense interactions and have no one to process it with uh, and no one to experience it with. And so one of the single most powerful things I think that we can do is make teaching a team sport. One of the things that we do at Uncommon Schools that I think has been most successful for us, and maybe this is a way of answering both, question, both the first two questions, is um, invest lots of time in teacher training and teacher-driven teacher training. So we have, we have a longer school day and a longer school year. A lot, of us, a lot of people know that about our schools because there's so much to do to catch kids up. But we dismiss kids early on Friday at 1 or 2 o'clock, and there are you know, three or four hours every week of staff training. Sometimes it's you know, a department meeting you get, or a grade level meeting, and you get together with the sixth grade teachers and you watch video of each other, or you, you know, share best practices, or you look at student work and see what they've been writing this week. Sometimes it's more you know, centrally driven. Let's make sure we've figured out our systems and routines for the classroom so that we're efficient. But um, it's all team oriented in that like, you get together with a group of adults. And I actually have a picture here of, um, you should probably be familiar with who these guys are. I think, they, I think they're playing team handball here. Oh wait, can you show my slides? Is there a way to show my slides? It's much funnier when I tell you, you probably are familiar with these guys. Team handball, or you get how funny. This, 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 like, this is how, uh, this is what training looks like for FC Barcelona. They train as a team, right? And that makes it pleasurable and fun. They have to do a lot of training and a lot of practice to be great. And uh, they tend to enjoy it. Teachers can do the same thing, right? Teaching should be a, a team sport similarly. And the other thing that, the other reason I have this picture is because one of the least understood things about teaching is that it's a performance profession. You do it live in front of an audience, right? So unlike being a lawyer where if you're having a really terrible day, you can pause and call another lawyer and say, what does the uh, Latin phrase habeas corpus mean? Hmm. Thank you. Then you, put it, then you put the phone down, you walk down to the end of the hall to the little lunchroom where you get those fancy snacks that lawyers get that teachers don't get. Uh, and then you go back to your desk and then you start writing again. Right? If you're a teacher, you can't do that because you're live in front of 30 kids and if you ask a question, they all look at you funny. Like, you're live. You gotta solve it then. And if you're having a great lesson on Wednesday, it guarantees you nothing for Thursday. You have to redo it all over again with a totally different audience and, uh, and maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. Every profession in the world that performs live like that, that thinks of itself as a performance profession, prepares through practice. They prepare like these guys. They rehearse the skills that they want to execute in the game beforehand. One of the most powerful things one of our schools did was the teachers got together. There was, there was a teacher who was really struggling with discussion in the classroom. She was reading, I remember the novel, she was reading Diary of Anne Frank, and she would ask the kids a question, and in her lesson plan she said, 10 minute discussion on end of the chapter. And she would ask the question that she thought was really brilliant. Um, why is Anne anxious? when she hears the knock on the door. And the kid would give an answer, and it would be, the first answer would be totally wrong. And so then she would say, no, Anne is anxious when she hears a knock on the door because she thinks it might be the SS coming to take her family away. And like, that was the end of the discussion, right? No, one, <laughs> no more hands after that. And so she realized that when she got an unexpectedly wrong answer from a kid that she wasn't prepared for, she froze, and she didn't know how to deal with it, and she got very nervous, and she shut the discussion down. So she got together, the principal suggested, why don't you get together with Nikki, who's another teacher in the school. And Nikki's really good at discussion. And what Nikki and this other teacher, Maggie, came up with was Maggie read the questions from her lesson plan for next week's discussion from, from Anne Frank to Nikki for 10 minutes a day, three times a week. And Nikki pretended to be a kid, and she gave her a, an unexpected wrong answer. 
And then Maggie had to think about it and say, oh, okay, and I, here's how I deal with that. And then Nikki gave her another, and Maggie was like, okay, I can deal with that. And then they'd laugh a little bit, and Maggie would say, no, actually, the kid would say this, and then, and then Nick would say, okay, well, I'll say that. And, you know, and so by doing this for 10 minutes a day, three times a week, Nikki got, I'm sorry, Maggie got very comfortable in the situation of, oh my gosh, I never thought a kid would say this. Uh, and so she was poised and comfortable and she could think and she had practiced how to respond to those. And so all of a sudden discussion flourished in her classroom. What she did was what the, she practiced before the game. Teaching is an incredibly complex performance endeavor and one of the things we never make time for is practice. So to return to my long-winded answer here, what we do at Uncommon Schools is we take three hours a week for practice and training together as teachers, often teacher-driven, sometimes administration suggests topics. And before teachers arrive for uh, the first day of school, we do three weeks of training together where we work on our lesson plans and get feedback on our lesson plans together. And our bet is that that time together will result in uh, more significant outcomes. Uh, the first thing you'd have to do if you made me the Secretary of State for Education is start a job search for your new Secretary of State for Education because I would probably last a day in the, in the job. Uh, I, I mean, in, in some ways, this is an answer to your, your question about poverty also. There, ha there have to be solutions to poverty out there, but I'm not a politician. I'm a teacher. And so what I think about is I have, I have to teach those kids in the world that we have because I can't wait for another world to come about. So yes, it's unjust. Yes, it's unfair. Yes, it's unsustainable for democracy. But people have done better by those kids. And what I want to start by doing is disseminate every great idea that I can so that all those potentially brilliant kids in that high poverty classroom can graduate, go to university, and help us figure out the solutions to poverty. Um, and uh, uh, you know, there's, <laughs> there are people who are bothered by that answer, but uh, I don't want to wait for poverty to go away before we start doing better by the kids who are in our classrooms. Uh, I think the thing that I would do if I was Secretary of State for Education is uh, I would make the autonomy and accountability trade. Teachers are problems. The mo one of the other least understood things about the teaching craft is what a problem-solving profession it is. I want teachers to be free to problem-solve, and then I want to be able to tell them at the end of the day, this, this worked really well and this didn't. So I think I would more freedom, more accountability. I do the terrible work, particularly in, in the UK, right? There's no annual testing. I don't know if you know, do you know um, uh, King Solomon Academy in London? They had these sort of tremendous, legendary GCSE results this last year. Uh, the principal, Max Hamendorf, uh, for five years he operated without any data until they finally got their GCSE results and it turned out they were incredible. For five years he had no idea if he was doing it right. Uh, and I just think that like, that's brilliant and totally unsustainable, almost unreplicable. And interestingly, the way that Max got it right is he studied North Star Academy, which is a school that does get measured in New York, New Jersey, that has all these iterations of learning from its data, and so it's gotten very smart very quickly. And he built a school based on that. And so if I wanted to make schools better in the UK, at least, I would bite the bullet on some kind of annual measurement. Maybe, if it's not, maybe even it's not to evaluate, it's just to learn. But, um, I'd be the one who was unpopular enough to do that, and then they could fire me, and I'd be happier anyway. <laughs> I think the important thing is, again, like teachers are incredible problem solvers, so whatever the prob the challenge is, we have to trust in teachers to find that the, the people on the front lines are going to find the best solutions fastest. And so this constant cultural shift of new problem, new challenge, new thing that we don't understand, we, teachers' voices have to be included in finding the solutions. You asked about teacher, uh, the second question was about teacher training and um, what role it had. Uh, I'll t the, t the two most important, so um, ideally we wouldn't have to, we do a lot of this training in our schools. Ideally, really pragmatic, useful guidance about how to be successful in the classroom would get to teachers before they start in their schools. But the hardest thing to train in a teacher is content knowledge. What we've started doing at our schools is we hire for two things. We hire for content knowledge and we hire for desire to learn, willingness to learn, ability to learn uh, as a teacher. So often we would ask someone to come in and teach a sample lesson and we'd watch the sample lesson. This used to be like our great insight because in most schools in America you get hired by going to an interview and talking about teaching. And so what you get is schools full of people who can talk articulately and beautifully about teaching. 
And that is a very different skill from getting up in front of a classroom and actually teaching it. So our first great insight was, well, actually, we should have people sample lesson. And one time when I was a principal of school, I asked a teacher if she would be willing to come in and teach a sample lesson. And she said, you want me to do what? How dare you? And I was actually pretty happy that she said that to me because it saved me a lot of time. I knew she wasn't going to be right for our school. But what we realized over time was that more important than the sample lesson itself was the feedback that we gave after the sample lesson. If we said, wow, we really liked your lesson and we thought it was great when you did X, Y, and Z, but one of the things we do at our school is we cold call kids. We call, we call, kid, we call on kids whether or not they have their hands raised because that's really important. Uh, what do you think of that? Well, I couldn't really do that in this lesson because I didn't, you know, like, or, oh, that's really interesting. Why do you do that? Fascinating. Yeah, I, I think I could try that. I'd be really concerned about making sure that the kids feel like it's positive, but I could pull that off. Great. Why don't you come back next week and reteach and, let, and try and work in a little bit of cold call, and we'll see. If someone can take feedback, listen to feedback, come back, implement it, and get better in a week's time, if we can't win with that person, we are doing something wrong as an organization. So we hire for learning curve, for desire to learn. But the other thing that we cannot teach is subject knowledge. You can't teach a teacher a, a lifetime's worth of chemistry or history. So one of the most crucial things, I think, for teacher training to do is make sure that teachers have spent a lot of time on domain-specific content. They know their science. And domain-specific content about how to teach the science. It's much easier to do sort of generalizable training on cold calling, say, than here's the best way to present anabolic glycolysis. Right? That's, that's really hard. So uh, that, to me, is the greatest value add that teacher training can, can provide. Uh, the first question I didn't totally understand. You can re-ask it or we can, we can move on. It's your, you know. Do you know good practices of teachers to, um, to teach personalized projects mm. chosen by, yeah. by the same pupils? Yeah, it's great. It's, one of the, uh, you know, it's really important for students to transition from answering our questions to thinking of the questions themselves. Uh, so I think that uh, this is something that lots of great teachers do. I think the important thing to me is the notion of gradual release, which is I want to intentionally teach my kids how to think about what a good question is and hear lots of good questions and answer them before I just say, think of the questions that you want to ask. And uh, so I would expect that to be kind of a process, a system, even in the classroom. But I do think that's a common thing that we see in, in great teachers' classrooms. Yeah. Love is technique. I know that seems really strange, but I'm thinking of a teacher that I observed three weeks ago in a school. He's in the toughest school in the toughest neighborhood in Newark. And he's standing at the top of the stairs when the kids come up from lunch. And he's greeting the kids one by one on their way to class, touching them on the shoulder. Have a good afternoon. Hope you do well. Make sure your homework is done, young man. You know, like, it's a combination of, of warmth and smiling and, and pat on the back. And like, I expect the best from you today. You know, uh, all different kinds of love. It's beautiful. What every teacher dreams of being that teacher. No one dreams of walking into the classroom and being the teacher who can't connect with kids, who can't reach them, who can't inspire them. That's why people do the work. What keeps them from being that teacher is technique. I think people, I don't always know, I don't think, think at least as much as I do about the degree to which the way that he stands and where he positions himself and the tone of voice, the soft tone of voice that he uses and the way that he touches a student uh, on, the, on the shoulder here comfortably before it touches them warmly so that when he touches them because I need to talk to you, you know, you, you know you're in trouble, uh, the student can't say, don't touch me. You're not allowed to touch me, which kids do in the US. I don't know if they do it here. But like, that's unsustainable. If I've touched you 30 times already out of warmth and caring, then it, it's, it's weird to say you can't touch me because, heck, I've been touching you for, th you know, I've been touching your shoulder for th three months now. So the thing that allowed him to be that teacher was his mastery of techniques like the strong voice technique and you know, dropping his voice to deliver constructive criticism to a student, being calm, quiet power, allowed him to be the teacher that he dreamed of being. I think that if you don't enter the classroom because you, you want teaching to be about love, you have the wrong job and you won't last long. Most teachers that don't exemplify love in the classroom fail because they don't have the techniques to be able to allow them to do it. And that, to me, is why this is so important. It allows teachers to be the people that they dream of being and love the work and allows, them, kid, allows us to make sure that kids get those people in the classrooms reliably. It's a great question. Thank you for asking.
I think I go back to um, there has to be a virtuous cycle. I mean, any ideas have to grow to stay current because life changes and people change. I think that's why the advice in a book has to, is most powerful when it's open source. When you share it and people use it and they give you feedback on it and you change it. And you know, the only thing I know for sure about what's in my book is that it's wrong. Some of it has to be wrong. When I visited the great teacher's classroom uh, and she did the thing that makes her incredible, I was looking out the window or I saw what I wanted to see instead of what she really did and I was wrong. And, and certainly like if it's wrong for New York, it's got to be doubly wrong. Some things are wrong for here uh, in Barcelona. And so we have to be comfortable with the notion of constantly changing. So I'd say those things are current if they change and are constantly evolving. And there's a virtuous cycle of feedback from parents saying, yeah, this is a great idea, but actually when I said that to my kid, uh, he didn't like it very much, and uh, now he's in therapy, right? And so now we're, a little bit sm <laughs> now we're a little bit smarter, and we say, actually, what I meant by that is this, and, or you could try it this way. So I think the, um, they are current if they continue to evolve and constantly change, and they embrace the deep humility of knowing that um, the only thing you know for sure about your ideas is that they have to be, either they're wrong or they could be better. Uh, and in some ways, that was kind of forced on me by seeing the ideas in my book become obsolete so quickly. It just made me realize how smart, it, how smart people are when they use ideas and how much. And I've definitely learned more in the period after I wrote the first Teach Like a Champion to now than in the all the time when I was studying teachers before the first book. And now sometimes people will come to me and they say, I've read your book. And they hold up a copy of the first one. And I think, oh my god. <laughs> um, and I guess that's the way it should be. Character matters a great deal. I think anyone who's a parent uh, knows this intuitively, that the people who are around our kids uh, shape the way that they think about the world with their actions constantly. And so, uh, yes, that has to be one of our top criteria uh, for selecting people. So people of character, people who love to develop, who want to continue. You know, we talk about kids being lifelong learners, and if that's going to happen, the teachers have to be lifelong learners in the school and have to always be thinking about um, this, is a this is a profession that I've chosen that I will never be done learning about. And I'll always be trying to get better. And I'm not trying to get better because there's something wrong with me. I'm trying to get better because this job is so important. Right? So uh, they have to have that mindset, they have to have character, and they have to have subject knowledge. Uh, I talked a little bit about how we evaluate the, you know, the desire to learn. We run very small schools, so really we do the subject knowledge and the character part through a lot of conversations with people. What we try and do is get down to a very small number of people very quickly um, and then spend a lot of time understanding how they, how they teach and how they think about education. I don't know that I think there's a formula. You know, there's a lot of like movement in, um, you know, if you go to an MBA, they'll say, ah, you should give a, you should give an assessment. You can do a personality assessment to tell very quickly whether someone is, you know, ethical or has a learning modality. Um, I know I said earlier that, you know, measurement is the first step in innovation, but I don't really buy it <laughs> for uh, evaluating the intangibles of, of teachers. I think you just have to. Um, Keep your eye on those on the right compass headings about, you know, is this a person who I would put in the classroom with my own children? I would definitely be in favor of um, undergraduate study in their subject area for teachers as opposed to in the United States, many teachers study education undergraduate. And I would rather, if I could make a change, I would rather they study history or science and know their content deeply and then study the craft of teaching as a graduate student. Um, I think the data is pretty clear on that, at least in, in the United States. Um, the first question was about what we call level grouping, which is can you divide students into groups based on their ability? No. Not on ability, but yes, on achievement. Right? Those are two very different things, and so the name that I put on this is really important. Does it help teachers if I divide the class into kids who can add fractions with unlike denominators and kids who can't? my lessons be better? Yes, I, I believe that's true. Uh, we generally do it in our schools, but the groups are flexible. They constantly change. And the narrative is this is not about a child's ability. It's about how much they've mastered of the thing that you're teaching them right now. 
but it allows teachers to be much more targeted to be, you know, what we do in the U.S. is we teach to the middle. Uh, if you have a bell curve of kids in terms of their skill mastery at whatever you're teaching, you teach to the middle. And so the kids up here never really get challenged the way that they need to. And you never build a culture of challenge that pulls these kids up because you know, because these kids are, their minds are on fire and they're a model for the rest of the kids and the kids at the bottom get ignored too. So we found it helpful in many cases to do achievement grouping with the caveat that it's not ability grouping and that it constantly changes. We tell teachers you have to regroup all the time, you know, uh, so that the message is clear both to the kids but also to the teachers that achievement is fluid and it's constantly changing. And as soon as I decide that this is a low kid, um, that's a cancer. You know, this is a kid who can't learn. This, uh, it's not a low kid. It's low achievement by a student with immense potential.